So thermal conduction is our first topic uh, today, and it's, it's a relatively straightforward one. It's not something that I think, I hope, is going to tax you greatly, because it's relatively uh, self-evident, like you know some of the other things that we were looking at yesterday, I hope. Um, we can transmit thermal energy in, in different ways, depending on, on the materials we're looking at. Uh, we're going to focus very much on solids, and one of the key examples in, in the so well, solids and then gases. Uh, one of the key examples in the solids arena is, is metals. All right? Metals are good uh, conductors of, of thermal energy simply because, and we've been through this before in terms of conduction of electricity, because the electrons are uh, relatively mobile. Right? In a metal, you'll remember, uh, the whole metallic bond was derived or associated with the release of one or more outer electrons into the sort of gas, a sea uh, of electrons, if you like, um, surrounding the positively charged ions that were left behind. But that means now that if we put thermal energy in at one end uh, of a block of metal, then we have this highly mobile sea of electrons that can pick up the thermal energy, increase their internal energy, in other words, get more kinetic energy, uh, and they will charge around at higher speeds, colliding with other electrons, colliding uh, with the positive ions, uh, if I can put it in that sort of crude way, and transmitting through collision this additional energy that they've picked up um, and moving it through the metal as a whole. And it's this reason that the electrons are mobile and travel at high speeds, <laughs> relatively high speeds, uh, that means that metals become good um, thermal conductors. And the obverse of that, you won't be surprised to hear, uh, is that insulators, so those that don't conduct electricity well, uh, also tend not to conduct thermal energy well. And it's simply because now we have no free electrons, we have no mobile components that can move through um, the solid material uh, efficiently in order to, to transmit the energy. It's not that no thermal energy gets transmitted. It still can, but we're reliant now on the bonds between the atoms that make up the solid. So if we go back to our original uh, fairly naive picture of bonds between atoms as being <coughs> rather spring-like, uh, what that means is that you have to imagine that one mass is now being caused to vibrate more because it's got some thermal energy. And its only mechanism now of transferring energy to the atoms around it is through these connecting springs and this network of springs. And that's actually a relatively inefficient uh, way of doing it. There is an exception to this, and it's an element that we've uh, a particular crystal type of an element that we've talked about before, uh, which is diamond. Right? You remember you did some calculations on diamond and you <coughs> worked out the number of atoms per unit volume, for instance, earlier in the module, when we were looking at you know how we might put Avogadro's number and those concepts into play. Uh, and I made the statement that of all solid materials, diamond has the highest number of atoms per unit volume. Right. Now, one of the reasons for that is that the bonds between carbon atoms are extremely strong. It's a very rigid network. So, in fact, diamond, although a fantastic electrical insulator, is a very good thermal conductor because that transmission is now going through <coughs> basically very stiff springs. It's a very well connected, a very efficiently connected network. Uh, so in, in, in a lot of very large scale uh, modern integrated circuits, uh, there's a lot of effort going into incorporating very thin layers of diamond in the structure of the whole thing. All right? So it's something that's a good insulator, so it's not going to mess up the circuitry. But because it's a good thermal conductor, it will take heat energy out of the chip to the outside world very effectively. Right. These are not systems that, that you can lay down um, copper tracks in easily without messing up the circuits. 
Right, so it's a fantastic material from that point of view, and it, it offers the possibility of building, you know, truly large monolithic uh, silicon-based semiconducting circuits. So there are exceptions to this, but the general rule is that an electrical insulator will probably also be a thermal insulator. Now, if we get into liquids and gases, we're into another ballpark altogether. <coughs> In liquids, we get some conduction through the collision of one atom or molecule with another. One that's picked up more kinetic energy uh, through heat input than its neighbours will move faster and you know when it <coughs> collides it will share some of that energy. Uh, but actually the, the, the major effect um, as you probably all know is, uh, is convection. Right, density changes as the temperature changes, and that causes a whole body, uh, a whole body of, of, for instance, water uh, to move with respect to the surrounding material. And that's actually quite an efficient way of moving heat energy from one uh, part of our liquid to another. Um, relies on gravity, of course. Right? One of the interesting things, experiments in microgravity, is examining this effect in a liquid where convection currents now don't mean the same thing. Right? Density is only effective in terms of moving bodies of a liquid if they're in a gravitational field. Um, so that goes back to what we were talking about a few minutes ago. A gas is very inefficient right? because the gas atoms or molecules are relatively far apart. Uh, so the number of collisions per second is therefore relatively small, which means that the transmission of, of um, thermal energy, kinetic energy, uh, in this sense, is, is actually quite inefficient. And that's why you know double glazing panels, of course, have, have um, dry gas layers uh, in between the two panes of glass. It's a good way of insulating uh, materials. So let's have a look at thermal conductivity in a generic sense. Uh, and this image is quite <coughs> a reasonable one for explaining what's going on. And again, I'm, I'm sort of you know, appealing to intuition now in terms of, of how this might, um, might pan out. We have to imagine we've got a thermally conducting <coughs> material. So this is, this is the chunk of material in the middle here. All right? Um, how much heat energy is transferred along that bar is going to depend on several things, all of which I hope are relatively obvious. So it's going to depend on the temperature gradient. In other words, the difference in temperature between this hot end and this cold end. Right? Make that difference bigger and you would expect the heat flow <coughs> along that rod to increase accordingly. Right? We can take it to an extreme. If these two ends were at the same temperature, there will be no heat flow. All right, so if we increase that gradient, we get uh, more of a heat flow. Um, it'll also depend on the material itself, how good a thermal conductor is it. If we made this out of copper, it's going to behave significantly differently uh, to this material being made out of plastic or wood or something like that. Okay, So intrinsic to the material as well, is this property that will, uh, conductivity that will change the rate at which we can get heat energy along. If we make the rod longer, all right, the amount of heat energy arriving at this end is going to slow. If nothing else, what we've done is reduce the gradient, the number of degrees per meter, if you like, along the rod, but the temperature is falling. All right, so the rate of heat flow is going to be less. Right? It's, if you look at this graph underneath, which is essentially plotting what's going on in here. We've got a high temperature this end, lower temperature this end, and here's our gradient of temperature along the length of rod. Right? If we make that length longer, we stretch out the x-axis on this graph, in other words, uh, we get a lower gradient, a lower slope. So the rate of heat energy transfer goes down. The other thing that should be relatively obvious is that uh, in terms of a rate of heat energy transfer, uh, we can get um, a lot more 
a long a rod of a conducting period uh, material with that sort of diameter uh, than we could with a rod that has that sort of diameter. Okay? That stands to reason. Uh, get more water through a bigger pipe per second than a smaller pipe. That's all it's saying, essentially. So we can actually set up an equation that would describe this really quite readily without recourse to very much else. And this is what it would look like. All right, we've got a temperature difference between the ends of our rod, high temperature minus low temperature. Uh, we wanted a gradient, so we divide it by the length of the rod. All right, so difference <coughs> in temperature divided by length. The heat flow, well, what's that? It's the number of joules per second. That's what we're worried about. So here's our energy, joules, in a certain amount of time. So this is the rate of heat flow on the left-hand side. Here's our gradient, temperature difference divided by length. Here's the area of our conductor. All right, bigger the area, the easier it is to get large amounts of heat energy transferred. Uh, and here's the thermal conductivity. This is the constant of proportionality which is intrinsic to the material itself. So this number will be large for a metal, it will be low for wood or plastic or whatever. Yeah? So we can get at that number simply by rearranging the equation. We don't have to do anything cleverer than that. We end up with the, um, the lower equation on the screen there, excuse me. Uh, which is essentially telling us how we would measure this in practice. We would have to measure a rate of uh, energy transfer and then some physical parameters to do with our conducting material itself. And typical values, I suppose, across the range, well, a high one would be a metal like copper, so 380 uh, watts per metre uh, per degree. Um, a low conductivity material again would be something like a glass. All right, so it's the same sort of thing as thermal expansion. Same sorts of materials in, at the same ends of the spectrum. And for a glass, we're down several orders of magnitude, so it's it's well under one watt uh, per meter per degree Kelvin. Everyone content with these units? Why the conductivity given that equation would have to have those units? might be worth thinking about that. Someone sometime might expect you to do some sort of dimensional analysis on this. <coughs> Watts, all right? Joules per second. Well, that's true. That's just this top line of our fraction. All right? Here's energy, here's time. So joules per second. So that's where the watts come from. Uh, on the bottom line, so, you know, this is per whatever. Uh, we've got a temperature difference, so a number of degrees Kelvin, so here's our K to the minus 1, that just comes from this bracket down here. And then we've got an area divided by length, which will leave us with length. Right? So that's where the per meter is coming from. So the dimensions again are predictable, given what we said the equation must look like from basic physical principles. 